Hey everyone, welcome to the third part of my Why I Love White Walls by Between the Barrett and Me series. This is going to be a longer video, so I want to make sure you go to the description box and take a look at all the quick links, so that way you can skip back and forth between all the different parts you want to look at. So in this episode, we're looking at the part that starts at around the 1.18 minute mark of White Walls. It's a 6-8 galloping kind of thing that goes into this triumphant ball of energy that makes you feel like you can slay a dragon or something like that, and then it gets to the chugga chugga part. Okay, so this section starts off with two different guitar parts, but on the repeat, it goes to a third part. The way we're going to dissect this section is by covering each part individually and then looking at them all in a conductor's score type of fashion where we examine what's going on harmonically. So, let's get going by hearing a snippet. So I'm not sure what the best way to explain this section is. So the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to go by the first guitar melody part, then I'm going to introduce the second melody part, which doesn't appear until the repeat, but I'm going to go into the second melody part, and then at the end I'm going to do the backing track, the uh, rhythm section. Because if I were to introduce the rhythm section first, I feel if I were to analyze the chords, you wouldn't really believe me and feel like I was reaching. So I'm going to introduce the melody parts that outline certain harmonies, so that way when we go to the rhythm section last, I'll have a little bit more credibility. So, looking at this first section, I see it as about two measures of E minor and then two measures of A minor. So we've got this power chord kind of thing. It's a it's all in six eight. So we got the one two three one two three, followed by this guy. And pretty much everything is all in E minor. It's just E G's and B's. So that makes it pretty simple to kind of look at. The next two measures are in A minor. So we have this shape. That B went into a C. So we're kind of looking at the third and fifth of an A minor chord. So even though there's no A, in the next measure, we have this figure. So we have the E, C, B, which is a passing tone going to the A. Then we have E, and then another B, which again, I see as a passing tone. So we have A, C, and E in that measure. So I feel like A minor makes sense there. So going into the next measure, we have this figure here. The way I'm looking at that is a C major chord. We've got C, G, E, pretty simple there. And then in that next measure, I have that major 7 in parentheses. I'm not sure how we're going to look at that, but we'll look into that further when we go into the other sections. But we start off on an F sharp, which would be the major 7th. So we got... I'm also showing it as G major 7 slash B, so we'll figure out why I'm doing that later on. Then the next measure goes like this. I have G major 9, so the reason I say 9 is because of that A, and it's accented in the next half of that measure. It could be an anticipation tone, it kind of depends on how you want to look at it, but definitely that major 7 is there with the F sharp right on beat 1. So you can see it as a G major 9, but uh, I guess the safest way would be to think of it as a G major 7, and the second half is straight down D major triad. So we got the A, F sharp, and D. The next measure is an A minor arpeggio. So if you've ever been to a guitar center, you've seen someone do this shape before. And uh, I like to alternate pick it, but I'm pretty sure he sweeps it. So I always play it. I do a cross picking thing where I alternate between upward pick slanting and downward pick slanting. It just kind of gets a good exercise in there, but I'm pretty sure if he sweeps it. Alright, going into the next measure, I have an F sharp fully diminished 7 chord. 
we got this figure here. So we got the F sharp, then we got that flat 7 E flat here, then C and A. So all the notes in a F sharp fully diminished 7 chord. After that, everything pretty much repeats until we go to this next section. In this next section, we have this figure here. Which is pretty much all a G major, G major 7 kind of thing. Uh, I say G major 7 because again we go... Because we go from a G to an F sharp in that measure. So I can see it there as a G major 7. And the reason I'm using my second finger to get that 12 is because in the next bar we have an A, so getting us ready for that motion. So in the next measure we got this. So again, because the A is accented on beat 1, I put add 9 on there because the A is the 9th and a G add 9 chord. There's no F sharps in this measure, so that's why I'm putting add 9 instead of major 9. We got the A, B, I'm seeing the C as a kind of embellishment, non-chord tone. I guess it's an upper neighbor tone is the right word to use. So we got the B, C, B. Going to the A and then the G. And then our next measure, I see it all as a uh, D major triad. So we got A, D, F sharp. And the following measure continues with that D major tonality. Then we go into an F major chord. In this next measure, I have F major and C major 7. The reason I have that major 7 is because that B is accented on the first beat of the second half of that measure. So, so we have the F major there. Going to the C major 7, which is, I guess, the inversion if you want to think of it in this measure. So we got B, C, E. And then in the next measure, kind of continues with the C triad. G, E, C, going into a uh, G major sound. We got B, D, G, going into a D7. I'll explain the 7 later on, but for right now, it's your guitar center sweepy thing. Uh, the rhythmic figures here, this is how I hear it. I see a lot of stuff that's dotted 16th notes throughout the whole time, but I kind of slowed it down and kind of just played steady. Uh, eighth notes, and I feel like for sure that second half of the measure is correct with this figure here. It's four sixteenth notes followed by four eighth notes, but we're still keeping the uh, six eight kind of feel. So we got this. Followed by an F sharp fully diminished seventh arpeggio with the same rhythmic figure. And that's pretty much it for that first main melody part. So let's look into the second melody part that harmonizes with this one. All right, so looking at this second guitar melody, I feel it kind of reinforces our original analysis of everything. So these first four bars are an E minor and A minor kind of thing. So we start off with this arpeggio sequence here. So we got a B. We got an E, and we got a G. And this shape is coming from our E minor triad, kind of six shape arpeggio. And then we go into an A minor kind of thing. I guess you want to think of it from this kind of shape. The A minor cage shape, if you want to call it that. Again, A, C, and E. So we've got an A minor there. Then we're going into the next bar, which has a C and G major 7 kind of thing. So we start off with this. From our C major triad. Going into our G major 7. 
So we got the G, the D, and the B. And then continuing with that G uh, sound, we've got this shape, which is our G, B, D, from our A major shape from our cage system. So we got D major arpeggio again, going into an A minor sound. So we got this. I'm tapping there. Again, just starting on the C, so C, E, A, which is still A minor. And then we're going to go into an F sharp diminished 7 arpeggio in here. So we got this. We got that E flat again, so F sharp diminished. So then we're going to go into that second part. So we got a G major triad kind of thing way up here. So we got this guy here. Yeah, so uh, 24 fret guitar helps for this. So we got D, G, B, D again. So. And then our next two measures are outlining a D major arpeggio. So we got this. So we got the D, F sharp, and then the A. And then another D. Then we're going into the F major shape, which is this guy here. And that measure goes going from an F major into a C major arpeggio. And then continuing with that C sound, we go into a C and G measure. So we got this here, the C major and the G major. Then we go into an F sharp diminished chord. Then we go into an F sharp fully diminished 7 arpeggio. So we got this guy here. And that's it for the second guitar part. Alright, so with our rhythm guitar, we have something at the very beginning that pretty much resembles the first guitar part. So we've got something like this. So we got the E and the G, so we have the E minor, which is supported from our original kind of analysis. Then we're going into these next two measures that support the A minor or even an A minor 7 kind of sound, so we got this. So the reason I say A minor 7 is because we got this figure here ending on the G. So if you want to include that G, I could see you saying A minor 7, but it really doesn't have to be in this case. So then these next two measures go like this. So we have a C power chord. We have a C power chord going into this kind of new chord. So originally we saw it as a G major 7 chord. So because this is the lowest part of everything and we have this B in the bass, we can see it as a G major 7 slash B chord because of this. So the C is kind of looking more like a uh, pedal point kind of thing because it's being sustained out from before. So we have and that B going down goes into you know, our G. So the G and the B are in our B major 7 chord. The only one that isn't is that C and I feel like it's kind of uh, a pedal point kind of thing. It's kind of being sustained from before. Then we go into a G power chord, which of course we're in G major, so that works. And then we go into a D power chord, which again supports our D major uh, interpretation of the whole thing. So then in our next measure, we have this, followed by this. We have an A power chord, which you no know, goes with our A minor interpretation. Then we have an F sharp diminished type of power chord. It's always with the fifth, but because but because there's no C sharp in there, it's a C natural. We have this, which supports our F sharp diminished interpretation of everything. Then that section repeats again. Then going into our next section, we kind of see it all as a uh, G major, two measures of G major, and then two measures of D major. So our rhythm part goes like this. And then we go into our D major part, which goes like this. Well, 
mostly working with the uh, major thirds there. The B, the G and the B. And the D and the F sharp. Then we're going into an F kind of sound. So we got this. Which kind of mimics our uh, phrase from before, but it's just now in an F kind of total cent tonal center. We have that sustain thing. Um, there the F is kind of not supposed to be there. It's kind of the pedal point thing. So we have uh, the other parts kind of supporting a C major kind of sound. Then we're going into this power chord, which is of course a C power chord going into a G power chord, which supports our G interpretation. Then we go into the next part that goes like this, which supports the way I kind of interpreted the uh, rhythm. So we have three eighth notes followed by a dotted quarter note twice. So that kind of lines up with our sweeping pattern that happens there. We have a D power chord there, which makes sense with our D from before. Um, we can also see it as uh, a D7 because of our F sharp diminished harmonization that's happening there. So the C and the F sharp diminished chord can kind of make this sound like a D7 chord. Then we're going into an F sharp fully diminished, which is uh, this guy here. Which has our E flat right there as our low note, so uh, it's almost like an F sharp fully diminished seventh with a, you know, what is it, third inversion with an F flat in the bass, an E flat in the bass, and that's pretty much it. That leads us into the next section. Okay, here we have all three parts all at once with some chord voicings to display the progressions. I took away the tab for the other parts so everything would fit better on the page. I want to preface this by saying I'm not a music theorist and I know that functional harmony in minor keys is not as set in stone as it is with major keys, but I'm gonna try anyway. Viewing the piece in E minor, we start off on the one chord, which is E minor, and then go to the four chord, which is A minor. It's a tonic to predominant kind of thing that keeps E as the common tone. From there, we go to the sixth chord, which is C major. The C major shares the E and the C from the previous A minor chord, so that makes this a smooth transition. The sixth chord also has tonic-like functionality. Then it goes to a three chord, which is the G major seven, which has the G in common with the previous chord, and also has tonic-like function. So we've got something like this. This is then followed by our 7 chord, which is a D major. The D major has tonic-like functionality in E minor, but the D major leads to an A minor chord, which is our 4 chord. While going from a dominant to a subdominant chord isn't totally unheard of in popular music, I feel like this could be seen as an extension of a D9 chord, with the C and E from the A minor being the flat 7 and the 9, respectively. We then go to the 2 chord, which is an F sharp fully diminished 7th chord. We can see this as an extension also of the D7 flat 9 chord, with the F sharp A and C already in the D7 chord, and adding that E flat, which would be the flat 9. That leaves us with three dominant function measures with a flat 9 that wants to resolve down to E. So we end up with something like this, starting from the C. And this wants to resolve down to E minor. And it does in the next measure. That leads us to the repeat. So let's look at the next section. I see this next section after the repeat as being in G major, which is our key's relative major. Here we have a G chord going to a D chord, which is our typical 1 to 5 tonic to dominant progression. We then go into something a lot more interesting. We go from a D major to an F major chord. The F major is not a diatonic chord in the key of G major. I'm sure there's a lot of ways to interpret this, but I think the two simplest explanations are a 4-4 relationship or a chromatic median relationship. This isn't mutually exclusive. The 4-4 is like a secondary subdominant type of thing. It's like going counterclockwise on the circle of fifths. The F goes into a C chord, 
with that F being held out from before, kind of like a suspension. That leads us to our regular C major chord. So, so far we have this. That C major chord is our predominant four chord, which then goes into G major, our one chord. So all of that makes sense so far. This then leads us to our five seven chord, which is our D seven chord because the D is the lowest note in that rhythm part. Then, just like in the previous section, we see an F sharp fully diminished seven chord. I have slash E flat because E flat is the lowest note. The fully diminished chord has two tritones in it, the F sharp and C, and the A and E flat from our rhythm track section. This seven chord has dominant function with that E flat that wants to lead us back to E minor for our chuggas. And that's it. Now you can play white walls around the campfire on your buddy's $75 pawn shop guitar. Okay, so that was a longer video than I intended to make, so I'm going to try to keep this outro short. So please leave me any comments or questions in the comments section, and please like and subscribe to this YouTube channel so that way you can check out the next video when it comes up. And I include all my social media profiles in the description box so that way you can check those out too. So, until part four, see ya!